Hello and welcome to another episode of Raw Code Live at the Raw Code Academy. My name is David Flanagan and I am your host. You may know me as Raw Code across the internet. First, we've got a little bit of housekeeping before we dive into Project Sigstore, supply chain for Kubernetes containers and other things. Now, the housekeeping involves first subscribing to the channel. If you're not already subscribed to the Raw Code Academy, please do so now. Click the bell and you will get notifications and alerts for all new episodes as we explore the cloud native landscape together. If you want to join and chat with other members of the Rockwood Academy about all things cloud native, Kubernetes and everything in between, join us on the Discord at rockwood.chat. And if you want to support this channel, please take a look at the memberships options, <laughs> membership options available at the Rockwood Academy on the YouTube page. You can subscribe for as little as a single dollar a month and get loads more cool goodies. Nailed the intro. Thanks. I'm getting insulted already before we even started. Thanks, man. <laughs> I do my best. All right. Uh, today we're taking a look at Sextor. I am not smart enough or wise enough to guide us through this journey. So I am going to introduce Dan Lawrence. Hey, man. How's it going? Great. How are you? And I, well, I mean, I was better until I fluffed the intro a couple of times. But other than that, I'm doing pretty well. Uh, can you, for the audience, if they're not familiar, just tell us a little bit about you, please? Sure. Uh, yeah, I'm a software engineering lead at Google. I work on our open source security team. Uh, so my job for the past couple of years has been trying to make it easier to build open source software securely, make it easier for Google and all of our customers to use it securely and not have to worry about these nasty supply chain attacks that keep happening and are all over the news. Nice. So we're going to be taking a look at Thigstore and the multiple components of it today. Like, So how would you describe the project to people? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. So Sigstore is a little complicated of a project. It's got a bunch of different components and a bunch of different entry points, depending on exactly what type of software you're trying to build or consume or anything like that. So we're going to start uh, with all of these intros with the Cosign tool. Uh, the Cosign tool is spelled C-O-S-I-G-N, and it's designed to make signing and verification of container images really, really easy. Here, we'll start there because this is a cloud native stream, um, and containers and Kubernetes should be pretty familiar to most people. Um, all the different components we'll kind of explain as we get through them, um, going through some of the demos. Uh, but at a high level, um, the overall goal for Six has been to kind of do what Let's Encrypt did for HTTPS and certificates, but for uh, open source code and signing instead of encryption and web traffic. So Let's Encrypt set out uh, a few years ago uh, to make it easy and free to get SSL certificates, um, because before that they were expensive and hard to get, and so people weren't doing it. So web traffic was uh, insecure. Um, they made it free, easy, and automatic, and now something like 98% of all web traffic is encrypted because people want to do the right thing if it's easy and free. Uh, we see the same thing in open source code and software supply chains today where there are some kind of existing code signing systems, but they're really expensive. It's like 500 bucks to get a certificate to sign your code to ship it for different operating systems and platforms. So most people just don't do it, especially in large open source projects where you know there's not even a business that could be verified and that kind of thing behind these projects. So we've got a certificate authority that we're going to be playing around with today to get some code signing certificates issued based on your email address. There's a bunch of different tools inside of Cosign2 to sign images with YubiKeys and KMS systems and Kubernetes secrets and all of that fun stuff. So depending on exactly how you're getting the image, who's producing it, who's signing it, we've got uh, tools and flags and features for all of that here um, that we'll be walking through and then we'll be explaining how kind of the six store infrastructure makes all of this possible. Awesome. Quite a lot there we could probably dive into, but um, I think the, the first thing I want to just say, like, what the fuck the deal with prices of certs 10 years ago? I mean, I remember working for, sorry, I don't mean to swear, it's only afternoon here, but uh, I remember working, you know, 10 years ago, even longer, and you had to go buy all of these certs, and they were like $500 plus if you went with a reputable company to get your website delivered over SSL, as it was back then, but... Uh, and now it's just something that if anyone new to development has Let's Encrypt available, it's just an absolute game changer. So it's really cool. Um, I won't complain about I, I won't rant about EV certs either. I'll leave that for another day. But it, um, And actually, the EV certs are the super expensive ones. That's kind of what you need to get for doing code signing today. So it's, it's really bad. Yeah. But we are talking about supply chain, right? And that's one of the... I think we've seen that a lot over the last 12 months. I mean, how many supply chain checks? I mean, I only know what I've seen in the news, which is probably the more high profile ones, but I'm assuming you may have more visibility into what's actually going on in the ecosystem right now. Like this is a really prominent problem, right? 
Yeah, they've they've been happening for years. Um, they've been accelerating, uh, I think, for a couple of reasons. Open source is getting more and more widely used, which is great for open source, uh, but more companies are using it. Um, not all open source has a lot of people working on it, a lot of people looking at it, unfortunately. Um, there's kind of this misconception that if it's on GitHub and the project has a bunch of stars, then there are going to be no bugs inside of it. Um, as a maintainer of a bunch of projects with a bunch of GitHub stars, I can tell you that's incorrect. All of my code has bugs. All of the code you're using has bugs in it. Um, and so, yeah, the, the supply chain attacks either through you know bugs that were put in unintentionally or the scarier ones where people kind of take over GitHub accounts, they yeah. steal credentials to container registries, um, are, are coming, they're coming quick. Um, thankfully, uh, there are actually some huge ones over late last week over the weekend that thankfully were a researcher who reported them rather than uh, an attacker. But somebody threw some misconfigured GitHub actions uh, managed to get write permissions to the entire PyPy package index. Oh, damn. Could have tampered with, changed any of those packages in there. They're not really signed today, so nobody would have known. Thankfully, he reported it and got these issues fixed, got the GitHub actions locked down a little bit, but that would have been a really, really scary one. Um, there's a similar one. I think it was even the same person, actually, uh, with Microsoft VS Code's GitHub repository. Um, got write permissions to branches there that would have triggered releases and pushed out you know, malicious versions of VS Code. Um, anybody that's kind of thinking about this and paying attention uh, now would realize how terrifying and scary that would be if somebody compromised the IDE that 99% of other developers use, you know, what kind of backdoors would then get put into all the code built? That's why I only edit code with said. So, you know, <laughs> I just write it on a piece of paper and hand it to somebody else. <laughs> nice. All right. Yeah, that's terrifying. There's now been, you know, executive orders in the United States to help start locking a lot of this stuff down and securing it because governments are getting hit with ransomware. A lot of scary things. Yeah, it is very scary. And uh, Sigstore and its components help alleviate a lot of these concerns. Is that is that the best way to describe it? That's the idea. Yeah, I think uh, when we talk about open source security, um, there are kind of two high level you know, problems that I think are orthogonal. They're, they're different and we've got to address both of them. Um, the first one is that all the code uh, is open source. Um, which is great, but it means uh, you know anybody's writing it, anybody's working on it, you might not have any idea who the maintainers are. Um, that's pretty cool in some ways, but it's also scary because anybody that spent time on the internet knows that not everybody on the internet is a nice person. And so you're taking code from you know potentially bad people and running it. And even worse, you don't even know where the code is coming from for the most part. If you Docker pull some container, you have no idea where that came from, if the code even actually came from the repo that is paired to the you know, Docker registry or anything. Um, and so that's kind of around transparency and not actually understanding what our supply chains are. Um, and that's the angle we're trying to address with SigStore. So if you've got a container, you can figure out exactly how it was built, what code went into it, um, what build steps were run, that kind of thing. Um, that doesn't make it secure. It just means you understand the supply chain. That's kind of the first step in securing your supply chain. Um, th there could still be malware checked into that GitHub repo, but today you can't even find the GitHub repo to look for malware in most of these cases. Um, so the second half of open source software and security is that it's software and it has bugs, some intentional, some unintentional. Um, so SigStore isn't going to secure everything completely, right? There could still be bugs, there could still be CVEs, but at least we're hoping to give you the tools to understand what versions of code you're running, where it came from, that kind of thing. So you can start addressing that second problem. Okay. Let me try and phrase this in my own words so I kind of understand sure. where sex door comes in, right? But I like to think of it as the problem. Like we all consume open source code in our projects. And what we can do is we can audit the code that we use and never update it, which is usually the enterprise approach, right? Or we can always be pulling in the latest one and trying to avoid all those security conflicts. And there's very little in the middle. Does SegStore help us bridge these two different approaches and have more confidence in frequently updating our packages and our dependencies? That's a really, really good way to put it. Yeah, and it, it's controversial and it comes up a lot about, you know, that strategy of how often should I be updating and that kind of thing. Um, I'm on the, the opinion that, yeah, you've got to be updating frequently. Um, it does put you at risk in some cases. It's a lot of work. It's tough. But I think you just have to be doing these updates. Otherwise, uh, you're behind. You're going to get hit with these CVs that are found years later, and then you can get yourself into a position where you've got years of code to try to update all at the same time, yeah. which is really tough. It's it's really bad. It's embarrassing when you get hit with one of those two. Uh, forgot to update struts that's been running here, and now everybody's credit card data has been leaked, that kind of thing. Um, so I think you've got to get to a point where you can be updating frequently. Um, you know, shift it left if you want to use buzzwords. Update your dependencies <laughs> as often as possible with stuff like the Pendabot. Um, 
and then the scary part there is, you know, the whole, well, it wasn't broken. Why would I fix it? Um, now I'm, you know, putting myself at a bigger risk, pulling in all these new changes constantly. Um, and that's where six, we're hoping to make that easier and safer and less scary to do by making it you confident basically in all the code you're pulling in constantly knowing where it came from. Nice. Well, easier and less scary sounds good to me. So why don't we dive in and get started then? Let me pop up my sure. screen share. We're still here. We've got the Sixler website here. Um, you suggested that we're going to start by taking a look at the Cosine project first to play around with some container image scanning. So we'll do that right away. Um, to the people that are watching, thank you for all the comments so far. If you have any questions for Dan, feel free to drop them in the chat. We'll do our best to tackle them as we go. All right, step one, uh, Cosine. This is container signing, verification, and storage in an OCI registry. You want to break that down for us a little bit? Sure. Yeah. So what Cosine lets you do is, yeah, let's kind of stay right there. You can sign <laughs> container images that you built. Uh, you can verify those uh, signatures, and everything for it is stored in an OCI registry. So you don't need to run any extra services. This all just works with any Docker registry you're going to be playing around with today. Um, there's a quick little demo that you know kind of scrolls there showing the simplest way, but there's about 37 different ways to kind of generate and manage the keys that we're going to be using for signing stuff here. This is the simplest one. It just kind of throws one in a file on your disk. So that's probably the one we should start out with if you want to give it a try. But we've got some other cool ones that I'll show you once you get Cosign set up and get some stuff signing. Okay. So I guess my step one is to install the Cosign application. Yeah, we do have it. We just got a brew release. Um, maybe it didn't make it into the docs yet. So if you've got Go, you could go install. That might take a little while, or you can just do brew install cosine. It should work. Yeah, I'm happy with the brew install approach. Let me just drag the bottom of this window. Oh, maybe it's in its own tap. Yeah, I just forget how this works. Uh, here we go. Is there a tap repository on Sigstor? Yeah, cosine and wait, uh, tap. Oh, yeah, I can always pull down the binary, but if we know the brew. What is it called? <laughs> um, homebrew tap. There we go. Yep, brew tap. Sigstor slash tap. There we go. And then brew install cosine. You can do it all on one command. I learned this like last week, and now I'm just obsessed with doing it on one command. Oh, nice. Um, so actually, there's a really cool little Easter egg I'll show while this is downloading. Um, yeah. OK, so this just downloads directly from our repo. But at some point over the last year, Homebrew switched <clears throat> the packages that are stored in you know their default Homebrew um, repo yeah. from something. I can't remember what it was, but they switched it over to GHCR. Yep. So the GitHub container registry. Um, so Homebrew uses an OCI registry to store all of the binaries for Mac stuff uh, just because it's free and it's everywhere and it's really easy to put stuff in it. So these aren't containers you're installing with Homebrew for the most part, but they're just kind of hijacking and using OCI registries anyway, which is cool. Yeah, I've, I've noticed that with a lot of brew packages coming from G, GHCR. Uh, it's really cool the way they're using the OCI format there for that, definitely. But I think because this is your own tap, you would have yeah. to upload to that yourself rather than anything else. So we got a couple of comments already. Uh, so Kevin, or the Fire Flash, is saying it looks really similar to how RPM works. Uh, I'm not sure how RPM works myself, but I'll trust you. Take your judgment there. Uh, Kelly Jack is telling me to use Nix. I can't because I stupidly upgraded to the Mac OS beta, and now nothing works except my streaming software. So stay tuned for yeah, lots more. Sorry, there is a Nix formula or whatever it's called for Cosine too. I got it running in a container, which is awesome. Sweet. Uh, and there's a, a first question there for you. So is Cosine admission controller going to be adopted into Sigstor or stay in your personal GitHub? <laughs> Good question. Yeah, so this is probably referring to, uh, I have a little toy admission controller I was I wrote to just kind of learn how Kube Builder and the new admission controller stuff, the SDKs all put 
uh, work together. Um, I called it co-signed, um, C-O-S-I-G-N-E-D, to check to make sure images were signed. Um, I, you know, didn't write tests. The code barely works. I, I stuck <laughs> it up there. Um, didn't want to put it into the real SIG store thing. I wasn't sure if people would use it, if it was worth uh, spending more time on. Um, but then people started filing bugs, of course, you know, which happens with open source and running it in production and all that scary stuff. So I've got to figure out if I want to take it down or actually move it over into the org. Um, there are some other policy engines now that are adding support, so I don't know how much we're going to keep needing mine. Um, stuff like Caverno and Gatekeeper and a lot of the other ones Very are cool. going to support for yeah. cosine signatures. Yeah, it doesn't matter yes, how much but... you put a warning in the readme saying, do yeah. not use this. People are quick <laughs> because it scratches a niche or solves a problem. They want to get it in the prod and fix that. But, uh, yeah, so it's there. Um, I don't have a perfect answer. Sorry about that. Uh, all right, so we got cosine CLI. Do you want me to jump back over to the repo and type in that command? Are we just going to tab yeah, complete through it? Live from here. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if, actually, real quick, first, do you have a container we can we can work with? Do you have a container set up in some registry somewhere? It doesn't have to be super. Hey, yeah, yeah I've, I've got the clustered cool. demo application, which we could sign, which runs, at, which is stored on GHCR. So is that, that'll work? Perfect. Yeah, as long as you've got right permissions set up for that, that should be perfect. All right. So yeah, let's, uh, we'll start by generating a key pair. So you can just type generate hyphen key hyphen pair. Should I spend Docker up just now, actually? Uh, no, you no? Can Docker. Okay. All right, so generate keep here. Got a whole bunch of options. We're just doing it vanilla, so it's going to generate a private key for us. Is that correct? Yep, and you type. You should type in a password. Should or must? <laughs> I don't. I don't know what happens if you just hit enter, but hopefully it'll match. Yeah, there we go. Cool. All right, so now you've got two new files on disk here, um, which I'll explain quickly and we can show to people. Um, this uses, uh, Cosign uses digital signatures, um, which means you get two different keys. There's a public key and a private key. The public key is the one you publish. Um, you distribute that one widely. Anybody that wants to check your images can check the signatures against that public key. So if you just want to cap that, we can see what it looks like. Cool. Yep. So that, this is the public key. That's it. Um, it uses uh, elliptic curve cryptography if you're into that and I don't know, some details here. Uh, but yeah, we picked some good defaults. There are no real flags here. We only support a couple different um, algorithm combinations and stuff like that. So that's the public key. It's pretty small. That's the thing you have to publish and send around to let people check against. Uh, now let's take a look at the secret key too. So I said this is secret, but it's encrypted <laughs> with that password. So it's actually okay to show as long as you don't tell us the password too. So it says begin encrypted cosine private key. So nobody can do anything with this unless they also have your password. So hopefully it's not just raw code one or something like that. No, it's Can't ABC go. one, two, three. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Hunter one, two or whatever it is. Uh, Hunter two. Yeah. yeah, that's the one. yeah everybody <laughs> type your type, type your passwords into the chat here. <laughs> uh, yeah. So that's the, that's the one we're going to be using to sign stuff with. Um, so we are ready to go now with these two files. Um, now you can sign your container image. Cool. So if you remember the sign. URL, you just do cosine sign. <laughs> oh, it's saying I was just making that up, right? Okay. Oh, yep. That's right, though. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of different flags here. As you can see at the top, we support like all the different cloud providers have a KMS system that you can use. So you don't have to have the keys locally if you want to use that stuff. HashiCorp Vault has that too. Um, but if you've got the file, you can just do dash key and pass in the cosine dot key, the secret key. And then the name of the image you want to sign. So the GHCR clustered thing. Uh, we'll sign uh, we'll V2. Why not? Cool. You've got to remember the password. Ah, ah so you're not authenticated. You might have to refresh or do something there. Uh, da, da, da. I should have GH. Let's say off, login. I'm already logged in. I wonder if I need to do something for GHCR. When in doubt, Google it. <laughs> uh, login. Yeah, I don't think I've ever actually tried GHCR from my laptop. I know they give you those tokens automatically from inside of GitHub Actions. Yeah, I just assumed because I used the GitHub CLI that it would 
Oh, you just use a personal access token. Well, how would that work with cosine? It'll it'll figure it all out. Um, yeah, you do the Docker login or whatever. All right, okay, and, so let's... And cosine, it'll just work once you do that. Okay, so there's Docker spinning up. I'm going to create a personal access token, and then I'll log in. I'll do that over here. Set up flashing credentials on this stream. <laughs> Perfect. So I'm assuming you would not encourage people to use the the way that we generated the key and instead to use like a cloud KMS provider or something, right? It depends what you have access to um, and what you're trying to convey, I guess. Um, there are a bunch of different you know, reasons to sign things and it's but there's a lot of confusion around exactly what you're trying to express with a signature. Um, really at the, at the base level, all it means is that whoever had access to that private key signed the thing. It doesn't mean it's good. It doesn't mean it's safe. It just means that they use the private key to sign the thing. Um, and so if you want to keep it locally and you're sure you can protect it and not lose that password, that's a fine approach. Um, you can also use something like a YubiKey. There are some commands for that if you've got one um, instead, which means that people can't steal that from you unless they actually take the token, so you don't have to worry about losing it. Uh, the KMS stuff is great if you're in a cloud environment. Um, it's better than storing the password somewhere else in a secret manager or that kind of thing. Um, but there's some downsides there too, which is like, you know, how many times have people screwed up IAM on their AWS cluster or you know, their GCP environment or whatever? Um, you're kind of trading off... Uh, not having to lose the key with making sure that you get the IAM and the RBAC and all of those roles right so that you, know, you don't make it too broad so people can start using the key. So there's some, some trade-offs either way. All right, I'm just doing a Docker login. Okay. I'm logged in. I say that as a question rather than a statement, but... Yeah, so now it should just work, hopefully. Well, that seems promising. There we go. Awesome. Yeah, so all the credentials that Docker uses are set up in this kind of global credential helper file that's pretty well understood. So most tools know how to work with that once you've done the Docker log and stuff. Awesome, so now it's signed. Um, let's, well, naturally, we should probably just verify that first before we move on and jump in and show exactly what happened. Uh, yeah, so let's try the other half there. You can type cosine verify, and then you'll see all the different options we have here. Um, yep, you, now you pass in the public one instead of the private. I know I picked a different version there. I just wanted to see what happened. All right. So it says, so first of all, when I used a version that wasn't signed, we just get some sort of name unknown. So it doesn't know that something in this OCI registry exists a signature. Um, I'm not sure how those signatures work with the registry, but maybe it's not important. When we use a tag that does exist, we get some checks performed. Um, so there's cosine claims, the signature matches the key, and yeah, this the is the actual one. version, right? Yep, so that's the actual signature that got stored there at the bottom. Um, do you happen to have the crane tool? There are a couple different tools to work with kind of debugging registries. Um, if you have that, we can show exactly how the signatures work and everything. Um, the crane with a C, isn't it? Not yeah, C-R-A-N-E, like for lifting containers up and down. Yeah, I'm familiar of the tool, but it's not something I keep at hand. Yeah, it's, uh, it's the easiest way to do some debugging here. Cool, this is working nice. And it came from, no it didn't, no it did. Yep, it came from GHCR, nice. <laughs> okay. So do we want to? Yeah, so now <laughs> we've got Crane. Um, we want, Let's take a look at what the signature is uh, in here. So first do Crane, um, actually there's a fun little command first. We have to run, uh, do cosine, triangulate um, a little some trigonometry puns in here um, of the the image name we signed um, so we hide these things inside of the registry the signatures and the way we do it is with a cool little naming convention um, which should make sense in a second 
Uh, so the image we signed was clustered colon v1, or sorry, v2. Um, and the way a registry works is that there are tags and digests that refer uh, to an image. The tag is kind of mutable. It's just a string, but it points to a fixed SHA-256 digest for that image. They can't move around. Um, the way we find the signature for an image is that we take that digest, the thing that can't move, and we turn that into a tag and then tack a little suffix there at the end, the dot sig. So if we want to find the signature for clustered colon v2, we first resolve that to a digest, and that's what the cosine triangulate command did. Um, and then we turn that digest into a tag with a colon instead of the at SHA-256 thing there. Um, and then we add the dot sig. So the signature itself <coughs> sorry, is stored in this image. It's not an image you can Docker pull or run, uh, but just like Homebrew stores other things in a registry, that's what we do here too. So if you do crane manifest and then that thing, this is going to download the you know, bytes that we've stored in the oh, registry. Remove the chat 256, right? No, so leave that, just add the dot sig at the end, actually. All right, okay. And then if you have JQ, you could pipe it to that so it's more readable. Cool. Perfect. So this looks like a normal Docker image or an OCI image. Um, you can see it's got the layers, um, except instead of having you know a tar ball that would unpack into your system, we just cram a little signature in there instead. Um, so that's what that annotation is. Um, the signature is just that base64 encoded string. Um, the MEQ thing, if you take that and look at it, it's just you know, random bytes that were generated by the um, signing algorithm. And then the layer itself is a blob. You can see the digest for it. And that is the little payload we signed. So when we did verify up above, we got that JSON that spit out on the, that last line. That is the thing we signed. So okay, we store cool. the signature and then the little thing we signed here in the registry. That's how that all works. And so the verify step, when you typed in the wrong tag, it gave you that error saying it couldn't find a signature. Um, so that's what that was. It was looking in this location for an image, couldn't find it. Um, but then we did find it, uh, downloaded this thing, checked all of it, and it was good. Um, there are a couple other little features we can show here with sign and verify, um, if you want to see. Uh, the first one is you can add in little random key value pairs when you sign, and then you can check those too. So if you go back to your sign command, you can add in dash A and just make up a little um, probably have to put it before the image name because that's just a positional. Yeah, perfect. If you just do foo equals bar, whatever you want to do, you could put in a git commit, you could put in a release version here, you could put in anything kind of more meaningful than just signing the image itself. You could say lgtm equals yes, you know, whatever you want to do and just hit enter. So this is going to show we can actually sign images multiple times. So we're going to have two signatures on this image now. One doesn't have any of these annotations. This one will have the foo equals bar. Now, if you verify again, we should see both signatures this time, one with it and one without. Cool. So we see these two JSON blobs get spit out, and the second one has that foo equals bar thing. Nice. When you do verify now, pretend you want to you know, only check things with foo equals bar, you can add that into the dash A, and it will only show you ones with that matching thing. So people have built up you know, pretty good workflows with this to sign specific releases and then check specific releases, or you can put in container vulnerability scans or anything else you kind of want to write up in your policy engine. So I'm curious, right? Like this, this is a random image that I've pushed to a registry in the past, but I mean, I have no idea really if that is even still my image. Like what would be the actual workflow that we would encourage people to use with CoSign? Should, should they build it, sign it, and then push it to the registry? Or do they build it, push it to the registry, and then sign it? Like what would you recommend there? Yeah, so there, there's a couple different workflows that make that make sense here. Um, it, if the first one is trying to make sure that the image came from the source and was built the right way. Um, and so the best thing to do there is to sign it in your build system, like as close as possible to when it was built. Um, your build system usually knows the digest of the image, and so you just have the build system sign it at the same time. Um, so if your build system gets hacked or something like that, you're not really protected. But as soon as it leaves that build system, you at least know that that image is the same one that left the build system. Um, there's a GitHub action. Uh, we have a uh, cosine installer that throws it into a GitHub action if you want to use that. And then because uh, GitHub actions gives you those cool personal access tokens, then you don't even need to set up auth or anything like that if you're pushing and signing stuff in GHCR. Um, depending on your build system, you can plug in other stuff. Um, Tecton CD is a 
the Kubernetes native CI/CD platform that actually has built-in support now, where you can just kind of say sign all the images that get built with this directly from the build system. Um, so to kind of protect against that, uh, making sure that the thing is actually what was built, signing it in the build system is the best way to do it. Um, some other companies in you know, kind of regulated industries and financial stuff and healthcare um, need to make sure that you know two people have approved each change that goes to prod. So that's kind of a different flow. Um, and a lot of people there use like two different YubiKeys and two different people have to sign the image as the very last step. So that's kind of like, it's been built, it's been tested, it's been in our QA environment for a while. Now we have to have two out of these, you know, seven people sign it with their own YubiKeys um, as the last step. So you can kind of build up workflows with, you know, different levels of signatures coming from different places. There's no real one size fits all approach. But I think for most people, they want that first one of just signing the stuff that left their build system. All right, perfect. We've got a few questions, if you're happy for me to yeah. look for them now. Sure. So, let's see. I think we maybe covered the first one here. But 06 Kalajic says, how is sign and done in automation? Uh, do you put no password, or is the position that real humans should sign releases? Yeah, so that's that's the one we kind of just talked about. Yeah. Um, I've got a little demo app called like Sign Container on GitHub that shows how to do it in GitHub Actions, where you don't really need the password. You can kind of use it, and then there are even some different flows we'll get to next. Uh, okay. Using okay. things like um, OIDC and different protocols to sign things inside of a build system. So yeah, I think humans and systems should sign it, not one or the other. I guess. Okay. Uh, next question is: uh, Does the token have permission? Or I guess, does the token that we use need to have permission to push to GHCR? Yeah, that's another good question. Um, with this flow, what we did is we stored the signatures right in the same repository as the image, so literally right next to them when we did the triangulate command. So yeah, you need to have permissions to push to that one. Um, that doesn't work for some people where they don't want their developers to have permissions to these registries, only their build systems. So there are some flags to kind of redirect and store them in a different one. So it still uses that same naming convention, except instead of you know GHCR slash raw code, it would be something like GHCR slash raw code signatures. And you would say, I'm going to store all my signatures here so my devs can push to there, but not to the you know, bucket where the containers themselves are stored. Okay. okay. Uh, am I correct in thinking that cosine executable needs to be built with the YubiKey feature enabled? Yeah, another good question. Um, the YubiKey stuff, uh, depending on your OS and your platform, um, sometimes needs some native C libraries to actually work correctly with the drivers. Um, on Mac and Windows, I believe it just kind of works. Um, there are some go build tags uh, for Linux where you do need to have some special dependencies installed. It doesn't run by default on stuff like Alpine. So we published two different builds for Linux. If you're not going to use the YubiKey one, you can just do a native go build with no CGO. But if you want that, then you've got to use the CGO version, which is a little harder to cross compile. All right, one more question, and then we'll carry on. Barco asks, what does Triangulate do with multiple signatures? <laughs> I'm guessing it provides them all. Yeah, so we actually store all the signatures in the same blob. So yeah, Triangulate just points to the blob thing that has all the signatures. Um, when we saw the, if you do the crane manifest again command, we'll see now that there are going to be two layers. The first time there was just one layer. Yep. Um, so all the layers just kind of get appended up into this list. Um, so it shows you the address for all of those, and then we kind of go through and verify them against the key. We did both of these signatures using the same key, but you could imagine two different people with two different keys signing it, and you would kind of see all of those appended up, and we'd filter through them as we do verify. Nice. Okay, so we have taken a container image. We have signed it. Is the next step that we want to restrict our runtime to only run images that are signed, or is there something in between? Yeah, let's do a couple more things first. Right, okay. So I screwed up trying to get the policy engine set up this morning, so I'm stalling a bit too. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so let's uh, let's let's show some of the cooler, fancy stuff that'll actually kind of pivot and explain so the rest of Sig store and how that works. Um, let's do this. Is the cool experimental keyless mode that I like to call it. Um, we just did some signing with keys, um, but now we're going to do signing without keys. Uh, so we need to turn on the experimental flag first, um, and I'll explain why it's experimental still in a minute and all of that stuff. Uh, but it's an, uh, an environment variable. So do export cosine underscore experimental equals one. And yep, all caps, perfect. All right, now we're gonna do a sign again, except let's not pass in a key. So just do cosine sign 
you can leave on the annotations if you want. It doesn't matter. Yep, just the image now. No keys. The same image or a different image? Uh, up to you. Okay. That's it? Um, yep, just hit enter. It's magic. <laughs> there are no keys. We're going we're gonna to see some logs, and now you're... Ah, uh, yeah, you're only sharing your terminal. But what no, just no, happened here? All right, there we go. Oh, perfect. Yeah, it popped open a browser window. Uh, so we're going to go through here and do kind of the open ID dance. And if you see what was back in the terminal, sorry to make you keep switching. Um, but what we actually did here is we generated a key in memory. This is generating ephemeral keys. And now this is the CA piece, the certificate authority thing we were talking about before. So we're going to get a certificate from the SIG store CA uh, tied to the email address. Um, whichever email address you click on in that browser window. Um, so if you're familiar with Let's Encrypt, the way they do it is they you know, give you an automatic certificate by proving you own a domain name. And they do that with the Acme Challenge thing where they give you a little token you have to display on the domain name so then they're sure you own it. Um, we do the same thing here except for an email address. There's already a bunch of protocols for that. Open ID Connect is the one we use here. So we prove you have that email address um, and we give you a certificate for that email address instead of a domain name. So whatever the email is on the GitHub uh, login you just did will be in a certificate. So instead of signing with a key now, we signed with an email address. So if we do verify now again with no key, we will see the signature and the email address. Yeah. The magic keyless mode david at rawcode.com that's the subject of the certificate um cool we got some questions just uh that's super cool from noel and the chat there <laughs> <laughs> okay cool um yeah so i'll explain kind of what happened there because there's some magic behind the scenes it's uh kind of subtle to make all of that work <clears throat> including that last line the t log entry created with index line um, so the way this works, um, if you've heard of Let's Encrypt and certificate transparency, we kind of copy that same thing. Um, all of the certificates that we issue through this service get logged to a transparency log, um, which is a really cool data structure where it's append only and people can kind of verify that and check and monitor it. Um, so the entry there is 33319. Um, that'll only ever go up. Your certificate is in uh, that log, um, the signature is in that log, and you can look at it, and it will never get tampered with, and it will be there forever, the way the Merkle trees and fancy computer science works. Um, and so what that lets you do is it protects you against our service getting hacked, right? If our service got compromised or hacked, we could start issuing certificates for your email um, that you didn't request. We could just kind of bypass the open ID thing, which proved you requested it. Um, so this lets people monitor the log for any certificates issued for their email address. If they see something in there, they say, hey, I didn't sign a container that day. Uh, they know something bad happened. They also know the exact container that got signed too. Um, so it's not just something bad happened. They know, hey, somebody stole my email account. They stole my password because I accidentally broadcast it live on the stream. And they started signing containers with my name. And you can figure out the exact ones that they signed and tell people not to use those. Uh, so the keys were generated at the top there in memory. They never touched disk. They were deleted right after. Um, and so it would be pretty hard for somebody to get those keys. Uh, but there's some other kind of fancy stuff we do there uh, to protect against that too. You got another question? Just another. That's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of love for this approach, definitely. <laughs> Um, yeah, so this is a really good way to do it um, as a user if you're trying to sign with an email address. Um, it's a little harder to set up uh, for demos here today, but if you're familiar with projects like Spiffy and Spire, um, they use that same protocol, the OpenID Connect one, to do certificates and keys for machines. So you set up you know, uh, nodes and pods in your cluster with those identities that instead of an email address, it looks like spiffy colon slash slash and then some name you make up for your domain name and then the machine and everything itself. And so those services can go through the same flow too, where every time they want to sign something, they authenticate with their spiffy ID um, and we give that machine a certificate. So we can use that to sign stuff uh, in that short time window. So for build systems and everything, um, that's uh, if you don't have a fancy HSM or hardware security module or uh, KMS system, then this approach works great too if you're fine with storing these certificates in a transparency log. So I got a, I guess then a couple of questions. So yeah. the first one, experimental. Um, yeah. What is the status of this, and when is that likely to change and become generally available? Out that 
you know, transparency logs and immutable ledgers and storing data in something that can't be deleted and bring out a lot of, you know, GDPR and legal and, you know, what happens if people sneak bad stuff in there that you know, we're not allowed to host and that kind of thing, those risks. Um, so it's, it's good from a code and a stability standpoint. We're just trying to work through and get approvals from all of the lawyers and stuff like that to stand this up um, and let that data stay around and figure out what we would do if something really, really bad ended up in there. Um, it's nothing brand new to solve, right? The certificate transparency people have been dealing with this for years. Um, we've just got to get through that. So we're hoping in the next couple of months we can take that off once we figure out the playbooks for what we do in some really bad situations. Okay. Uh, how do I, like, I've got this index number. Uh, yeah. Like, how do I check for entries with my email address and, and, and things like that? Yeah, so we're going to have to get another tool that I don't think is in Brew yet, but we can download it and build it and everything like that. Um, but yeah, so you'll see when you did that check, um, Cosign did the verification. Um, <clears throat> yeah, existence of the claims and the transparency log is verified offline. Uh, so Cosign did it automatically when we did the verify, but we can kind of walk through the steps to do it manually if you want to get the Recore tool installed. Uh, let's see if we have, I don't think we have Brew for this yet. Your binary is published. Um, it's in a bunch of different package managers, but not brew. Um, or you can clone the repo, build it, or grab the binary yourself, whichever you want to do. Let's see, Darwin, yes, and the stuff is. <clears throat> you'll see these binaries are all signed too with cosine, so that's cool. <laughs> I download. I did. All right. So let's uh, let's scroll back up and find that index that it printed out, and we'll just grab that one right away. Yep. Just the number. Cool. Yep. Yep. I do record get dash dash log hyphen index. I think it is, and pass in that. Cool. And we'll get a bunch of hard to read data back out. Um, so this is the entry for that specific uh, signature we did in the transparency log. Uh, we store the thing we signed, um, the hash of it. So that's the data hash value thingy. <coughs> that's the hash of that JSON object we signed. <coughs> Excuse me. There's that signature there, and then there's the public key. So that is going to be the certificate. So you copy paste out that long thing. It's base 64 encoded. You can touch from the equal sign. So that's my trick. Um, should be able to see some more stuff. I don't think it copied right. It didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> What's happening? Yeah, you're losing the equal signs at the end somehow, right? It's losing much more than that. So let do that. Oh, wow. Ah, typing difficult. Try again. There we go. <laughs> okay, so that is the certificate that we issued for you. If you've got OpenSSL, I can never remember the commands for this. Mm. Um, OpenSSL, you can pipe that to OpenSSL X509 text. Maybe that's all you need. Let's see what happens. A million different OpenSSL versions. But there's some tool that'll show you uh, maybe no out. That's another one I have on here. Oh, sorry, not dash x509, just x509. All right, okay. There we go. Oh, and then do dash text, maybe to stick that on. We'll see. Yeah, so if you scroll up, you'll see the, all, the info in there where everything is stored, the algorithm, the key, your email address is there too at the bottom. That's the subject thing. There you go. Perfect. Yep. Um, so if you're, you can kind of tell this log, there's new entries that come in. You can just keep grabbing the index and verify it. Um, and the whole thing only works if people are doing that, which is nice because people are. So there are people that constantly verify our log and make sure that we haven't tampered with stuff. Um, in fact, if you do, do record log info, and now you're actually helping and you'll be a verifier of our log to make sure stuff doesn't get tampered with. Log info. One word. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so this is the first time you hit the log. You now stored stuff at that length. If you ever hit it again in you know a couple of years from now, um, 
then it'll make sure that nothing in the log up until now was tampered with. So you're helping, you're doing your part. Uh, for searching though, we can do, this is kind of what you might want to do to look through it for things with your email address. There's a search command. Search dash dash email, you can search on a couple different fields. Yeah, this should work, hopefully. And nice. that is just so the one. <laughs> yep. Perfect. So <laughs> nobody's been stealing your password you know, before. Um, yeah, so that's how all that stuff works. Um, there's a bunch of cool stuff with timestamps and everything to also help protect and limit the blast radius if you do lose your signatures. Um, but it starts to get pretty complicated quick. Okay. So yeah, that was all the three parts of SigStore, just the plain keys, KMS systems, or you can start using transparency logs and certificate authorities. Okay, so we've got Cosign, which is a tool for signing and verifying artifacts, one of which could be a container image. We've got Record, which allows us to work with the transparency log, get information out of it, do searches against it. And those are the two major components of SigStore. Yeah, there's the the third one, which is the one kind of behind the scenes, the one that actually issues those certificates. That's called Fulcio. Um, you should never really need to interact with it yourself. It's just the tools that get the certificates for you. Um, we we got a, a yep. couple of questions there if you want to tackle them then, and then we can... Let's go for it. And then there's kind of one other thing we'll do now that we've got recourse set up after these questions. Sweet. Uh, is, okay, so CPP for life. Is there any info about what service was used, GitHub, Microsoft, or something else to verify the email address? I'm assuming I added that last bound. Um, yeah, so uh, that's a that's a tricky one we're trying to figure out too. We we store that right. Uh, we have those three OIDC providers. It's GitHub, Microsoft, Google. Um, those are the only three we support. They're pretty big and trustworthy. We hope, um, but we do want to figure out how to log that info and make it available just in case something bad does happen. The problem there is that the info they give you back usually has some long number in there, um, which is kind of fixed and can be a privacy concern. So if you change your email address on Google, that number usually stays the same and you can start to, people can start to do some scary stuff like correlate things across email addresses. So we've got to figure out how to store it and make it available without leaking people's privacy. So we store it ourselves for a retention period just in case something goes wrong to do some incident response, but we don't publish that in the logs yet because it's a little bit scary. All right. Uh, we've got another question asking, so is keyless option using Filcio hosted by SigStore.org and the transparency log handled by Record? Yeah, so we run uh, those two services, the CA and the transparency log kind of is a, a public good instance. So the SigStore community hosts and manages those. Um, so it's set up as a transparency log, so you don't really have to trust it. You can audit it. You can't really do anything bad without it going onto that log in case uh, something does happen. Uh, but it does require you to hit these external services. So there's some other modes you can set up inside of like, like an organization to host parts of that yourself. So you don't need to be constantly going outside of your firewall to get certificates or to um, log data to the log. For the most part, it's just hashes. So you're not really leaking tons of proprietary information in a SHA-256 hash, but still sometimes you don't want to be um, even allowing outgoing network connections. So you can run parts of it yourself too. Sweet. I'm curious, that you did a, a signing episode with Pop on Cloud Native TV, right? Was that for this hosted Fuzio? Yeah, so that that was a that was our root key ceremony basically. So yeah, the full COCA and even the record log itself has to sign a bunch of things to make the proofs work and everything. Um, and we need a bunch of our own keys in order to do that. Um, and so keys are hard to manage; they're scary. People lose them. And so what we we did is we followed the uh, protocol defined by uh, the update framework or TUF, which is another graduated CNCF project. Um, it's not really a code base you can kind of just grab and start using. They do have some libraries and everything, but it's more of like a framework for managing keys in a you know, distributed setup like this. Um, and so there are five key holders as part of the six store project now, and we have like a rotation set up so people don't have to do it forever. Um, and we each have YubiKeys and it takes three out of the five to actually you know, sign things or delegate new roles or replace keys and that kind of thing. So if any one of us loses ours, the other four can fix it for them and you know, sign a new key. So as long as we still have three of them at any given time, we're good. So that was that event we did. It was the, the first one um, where we all had to kind of take them out of the box the first time and establish that root of trust that now we can use the update framework to make changes to and iterate on going forward. Awesome. All right. This is all very, very cool. What have we, what have we got next? All right. There's one more thing here, right? I talked about the signatures. They're kind of, they can just store basic information about the container, which is cool. 
Uh, if you sign in a build system, that's nice. Um, but what we can actually do is store more than just the container name. We can store stuff about how it was built. So let me get you a quick command to run. Um, and this works with our integration in the Tecton build system, but there's nothing really about Tecton uh, that's special here. Um, we have the Tecton build system generate payloads, basically, that explain exactly how something got built, like a container. So it's not just the container now, it has the exact commit that was fetched to do the build, the exact containers that were used in the build steps, all of that cool stuff. And it writes it in a payload and stores that in the transparency log too. Um, let me find the easiest number to send you so you can do this check quickly. Um, it's not working here. I've got a blog post where you could follow along. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, there's a typo. Um, all right, yeah, so the blog post is here. It's called the, it's the CD Foundation blog, and the title is called The Meta Chain. If you want to search for that, you should find it. Of course. Oh, for some reason, the command the is not working. Meta Chain CD. This one? Yeah. Verifiable supply chain metadata for Tecton. Exactly. So we did a release of Tecton that was signed with Tecton itself. That's why it's called meta. Um, and then it uh, stored all of that in the transparency log. Oh, sorry. That's actually the wrong one. There's a more recent one. But I got it working here. Let me send you the number to grab. Oh, sorry. I've got it. July 29th. So this is the last release we just did last week. So instead of just signing the containers that were part of this Tecton release, you can see that we signed these giant, they're called attestations. Um, and this shows all the info about how the thing was built. And that goes into the transparency log too. So if you start there at the top, if all you have is the container ID for the Tecton release, that's the SHA-256 thing. Show you the next uh, text box. Yeah, so if, you, if you've got that running, you've got the SHA-256 for a container. You can search that in the transparency log using that search command. So instead of an email now, we're just going to look up everything we know about that SHA. Mm -hmm. um, we get these entries here, and then you can download one, and you can see all the information. It was used all the parameters, the version information, the exact bash script that was used to build this thing. I'm assuming I could just run this on my own machine yep. as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I didn't want to try to read that UUID out to you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so yeah, this is everything that we need to know about this build. Yeah, that's exactly how it was built. You see the parameters that went into the Tecton task run. Those are all the strings, the key value pairs, where the thing was fetched from in the Kubernetes cluster, that long bash script. It's cloud native technology is based on bash and tarballs and YAML. Um, the exact container steps that were used. We had crane running in there. You can see the digest, all that stuff. So if something got compromised in any of these things, we, we have all the tools to kind of trace all the way back. Cool. Um, so this is all set up. You just install this in your Tecton cluster and you just kind of get this out of the box. Everything gets signed and logged. Nice. I like that. I'm curious, like this transparency log you said is a append only, is, is going to continue to grow. Like, does that mean that the data lives forever? Will it ever be trimmed? Do you deprecate or time to live older entries? Is that impossible because of the Merkle tree? Like, Yeah, so the way people normally do this is they kind of time bound stuff. Um, if you look at like the Let's Encrypt transparency logs, they have a different one every year. Um, they keep the old ones for some amount of time. Um, it's not a huge, huge, huge amount of data, right? It's not, you know, petabytes of data that we've got in here. Um, so it's not, it's nothing, it's kind of going to push the bounds of SQL technologies. Uh, but yeah, we do need to set up ways to kind of rotate and cut off the log uh, and then start a new fresh one, but still let you kind of search back through the historical ones. Um, the supply chain stuff is a little different because yeah, you run code that's, you know, maybe a couple years old, you might probably shouldn't be, uh, but people do that. Um, so we can't deprecate things as quickly as you can with certificates where once they expire, you don't care about them anymore. Um, yeah, it'll grow until we, you know, freeze it, and stick them, publish the archives, that kind of thing. Should people ever run their own log? Um, yeah, a lot of uh, organizations do um, or are trying to figure out how to or to, to run them. Um, 
it's not always the best fit. Right? Um, mirroring our log and verifying it is great. That's awesome uh, because we can get kind of multiple copies of it that are independent around the world. But a lot of organizations trying to run them internally um, doesn't necessarily make the most sense because the log only works if you have you know, people auditing it and checking you. And if you're all on the same team, you're kind of checking yourself and you're not really getting any of those benefits. It's easier to just use a plain database in that, in that case because you do get a bunch of complexity that only makes sense if you do have people that are kind of being skeptical and making sure you're not screwing up. Okay, awesome. All right, I'll throw two quick questions at you and then we'll, we'll sure. carry on. So we've got a question saying, is the Tekton integration through chains or something else? Um, yeah, so it's done through the, there's a little sub project called Tekton Chain. So that you install next to your Tekton cluster and you just start getting this stuff signed. Um, it can store stuff in you know, any database you want to. It doesn't necessarily have to be the transparency log. So you can throw it into BigQuery or DynamoDB or any of those document databases to do kind of more querying on later. Right. Um, is it similar to Intoto? Yeah, so that format is actually from Intoto. That's another CNCF project. Um, the Intoto project defines a bunch of formats for kind of describing the supply chain step. Um, if you think of a, a build step as a bunch of inputs came in, did a bunch of stuff on those inputs, and then a bunch of outputs came out, you know, those three things. Um, Intoto is uh, a really good set of formats for describing those things in ways that you can link back together and check. Sweet, thanks for that. All right, what what do we what do we do next? <laughs> Good question. Uh, I could not get my uh, cluster and Caverno and policy engine all set up. That was kind of what I wanted to do next. For sure, ah. you can set up uh, verification there. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what's going on. Uh, my cluster got all screwed up over the weekend, and I didn't get it working in time. Um, but if you look at the, maybe you could see the docs. I know they're working on a release that's supposed to go out any day now to explain how all of that works. Um, maybe we can find the Caverno stuff. Um, but yeah, basically you just write a YAML file with, um, so this would be under K-Y-V-E-R-N-O, their GitHub. Um, oh, so this is, the, okay, so this is the Caverno one. Yeah, this is what I was going to get set up to show how you can block deployments unless the signatures are matched um, with a little CRD they have set up. So you can put the public key right there. Yeah, it's, it's right in the main. On the main one. Caverno. Yeah, I don't actually know where the, their docs for it are. I had a set up a while ago it is in the release notes though we should be able to see it if you click on releases uh, maybe somebody in chat will know where it is um, image verification yeah so if you scroll down yeah there we go with cosine so yeah, if you get this installed and set up from ahead, because they haven't quite done the release yet, I think that's where I screwed up. I was installing an actual release instead of this draft. Um, then you can kind of define a new verific image verification CRD um, and put in some public keys and it'll block you from deploying. If you click that Google Doc link, that's what I was going off of. Ah, okay, cool. Yeah, so this shows what the CRD looks like. Um, install Ka Caverno, and then you just kind of stick a public key into some YAML. Um, that's just a normal cosine key, and then it would block all images that don't have that set. I did have this working at one point. I made a cool <laughs> GIF. <laughs> okay, so when I've got cosine running in my CI environment, signing all my images, yeah. we can, with Caverno installed to a cluster, add a new cluster policy that monitors for pods and checks that they are checks the images that match a certain pattern uh, are signed by a specific key. Yeah, and so then you can set it up to, there's the enforce or alert, you know, mm -hmm. failure action. So you might want to block it. You might just want to send an email to someone and warn them. You might just want to log it. So there's a couple different setups you can do there, but that, uh, because you can't accidentally, you know, there have been a bunch of kind of typo attacks where you've fat finger and type the wrong name of an image from Docker Hub and now you're grabbing something from somebody you don't know because you put two O's in the MongoDB container instead of one and people set up coin mining and all sorts of terrible stuff like that. Um, so okay. a bunch of different reasons you might want to do this type of policy. But if you get that set up in your CI system, it's all signed, then you know that your prod environment is locked down with stuff that came from that CI system. Yeah, this was merged 25 days ago. Uh, I'm assuming yeah, this maybe RC hasn't quite hit a release yet. <laughs> yeah, it's RC3 now I saw in the draft. So any day now it'll it'll come out. And I think, yeah, I screwed up and didn't quite get the release candidate running. <laughs> well, it says it's any... released, right? 142? Uh, it's still a draft, though, if you click on the... Oh, yeah, 141's a little... So, okay. 
All yeah, right. So really soon. Uh, <laughs> latest was one four one. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, well, definitely something cool to play with later. Um, I, I, I like this. I wonder though, like this wouldn't technically work with the keyless approach, right? Okay. Nope. So yeah, they. I don't know if I made it into this version, but you can see some discussion around. It. You can put email or OIDC accounts somewhere too, and lock down to that rather than um, just the keys. Um, and I think my little uh, admission controller people were talking about earlier you can do that too with a config map where you can put in keys or email addresses, whatever kind of combination there you want to verify against. All right, awesome. Very cool feature. I'm assuming that, I think you mentioned Gatekeeper earlier, so the OPA project are probably working on similar support. And I'm assuming Cube Warden probably going to have another policy um, that works with all of this. So it's nice to see that support coming from the broader cloud native ecosystem as well. Yeah, I've been trying to get it working in Kuboard, and um, I thought it was going to be so easy because this is all written in Go, and you can compile Go to Wasm, and you can get that running in Kuboard, uh, but the, the Go Wasm support isn't quite there yet, and you can't do a bunch of stuff you need in, in that, so yeah, it's soon. It's not Kuboard, and it's it's Go and Wasm, uh, unfortunately, so it, the, the spec that we have for Cosign explaining how this works is stable, too, so you could go implement it in something else like Rust that does compile down to Wasm a little bit better. But I was disappointed. I thought it would just be adding some compiler flags and then we'd have support. Yeah, just change the target to Wasm and hope for the best, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, you just can't do reflection, which turns out is needed for JSON parsing. So doing any kind of uh, Wasm in the Kubernetes ecosystem is tough because it's all kind of reflection based. Yeah, I, I think you should just jump on the Rust train. It's a, it's a, it's a fun train to be on, especially with the WebAssembly we'll support. It's, it's pretty sweet. <laughs> Yeah. All right. And um, is there anything else you want to show, or will we? Is that a that is? Yeah, I think that's a that's a good overview. Um, especially if you're working with containers, you can just grab cosine and then start to play with the rest of the transparency logs and the CA and all of those features. So, I mean, it, that was all pretty self-explanatory. Like running those commands, there was nothing too daunting there. It was all pretty nice, which just shows that it's a pretty great developer experience. Um, is this? Can I use cosine for? Like it doesn't have to be container images, right? I'm thinking of other open source projects I've got where we release binaries. Can I sign these binaries and publish to that log? Yeah, yeah. Uh, don't know how we blanked on that. Yeah, um, <laughs> the all the cosine stuff itself on the GitHub repo is signed with cosine. So instead of sign container, there's a sign blob command where it just kind of spits out the signature. Um, it's really easy to do that. The challenge is like, how do, where do you put those signatures? Um, and there's no standard great place for it. So for us, we just put them in you know that GitHub releases page, and you can check those with cosine too. Yeah. Um, the cool part is a lot of things are moving to the container registries, like we talked about. You know, OPA lets you put bundles there. Um, Envoy and Istio now lets you put WASM modules into a container registry. So, yeah, you can sign binaries, you can sign all sorts of other packages, but it's kind of cool to see everything moving and converging on the container registries anyway at the same time. Um, the other one, though, I think uh, you mentioned in your tweet today to chat about was the SBOMs, the Software yeah. Bill of Materials stuff. So there's a ton of different tools and formats for generating those and working with those. Um, but they're huge you know, documents that you've got to upload, store, and sign somehow too. So Cosign has some commands for working with those. And you can upload those. Uh, it works the same as our signatures. There's a, just a funny little naming convention where you just put a dot sbom at the end instead of a dot signature. Um, and then it looks like an image, so you can sign that too, and you can point that at an image and download the sbombs uh, for your image and that kind of thing. All right. Okay, I'll ask you one more question. If anyone in the chat has anything they want to ask Dan before we finish up for today, drop it in the comments. You've got a couple of minutes. Um, in fact, I'll, I'll throw two questions at you then. <laughs> so the first one would be like, do you see this being something that would be integrated with a platform like Sneak? They do a lot of code scanning, dependency scanning, and it feels like they should be able to maybe pick up on these signatures and the S-bombs and, and be able to give us more details as well. Is that something that already works or you know is in progress or... Any info there? Um, yeah, that's, I hadn't thought of it that way. Yeah, once the stuff is stored, you know, things like Sneak can you know, show it and render it in the UI. Um, actually, the CNCF Harbor Registry is working on that now, kind of rendering these and putting little lock green check marks next to things that are signed and aren't signed at the registry level. Um, we didn't just started working, I think, last week on kind of the reverse integration, though, which is how you might store these Sneak or Trivi scans in a registry for a container. It's a little bit different than something like an SBOM because they go out of date. Right? If you, just because something had no vulnerabilities today doesn't doesn't mean you know, nine months from now it has no vulnerabilities. Uh, these things get found over time. <clears throat> so there's kind of like a 
timestamp approach that you would put in there saying it had no vulnerabilities today. And then you might have an admission controller that says, uh, I want to only allow stuff to run that I've checked within the last 30 days or something like that. So you can kind of combine those scanners with timestamps and signatures to make sure that you're constantly checking them. And don't have to worry about forgetting an image uh, that's sitting and running in your cluster. Cool. And what's what's coming next then? What's the, the next major deliverables for the project? Um, yeah, the next one is really just getting rid of that experimental, that scary thing. So there shouldn't be a huge change in the UX at all. You'll just, you just won't have to set those flags and that stuff will just be turned on and working by default. Um, so you don't have to use keys if you don't want to. I mean, that's really just more making sure we have a playbook to do if uh, something sneaks its way into that log and we do have to delete and move things forward for other reasons. Um, a couple of weeks ago, actually, there was a fun issue with certificate transparency where a cosmic gray flipped a bit <laughs> and screwed up the Merkle tree. I don't know if anybody saw that. Yep. Um, yeah, they traced it down. The right data went into the log and one bit was flipped and it kind of invalidated the whole Merkle tree. Um, and some people pieced Bam. it together and figured it all out. <laughs> so we got to figure out what to do in those cases. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm glad other people are solving those problems. Uh, all right, one question from the chat and a uh, hello from Pop as well. Hey, Pop. Uh, CPP for Life is asking, um, is there any cosine integration with Go Releaser? Um, no, not yet. I don't think so. Nothing direct. Um, Carlos has been working on a bunch of our release engineering stuff. Carlos is awesome. I don't know if he's listening today. Oh, actually, he's on vacation. Um, but yeah, Go Releaser has some scripting modes where you can kind of, you know, an escape hatch to do other stuff. Um, so he's got some of those demos working. Uh, but yeah, it would be awesome to get some Go Releaser support. Especially if uh, people start storing random binaries in the GHCR registries rather than the little releases page inside of GitHub. I think that would be a huge win for everybody. Sweet. Kind of homebrew style. All right. And of course, people, it's open source. You can all contribute. Go check out the organization on GitHub at github.com slash TigStore. All right, Dan. That was, me on. that was awesome. Uh, thank you so much for taking time out of your day and, and kind of guiding us through uh, TigStore, Cosign, Record. And keyless stuff is all very, very cool, all very exciting, and we can't wait to see what happens next. So um, have a, a great day, and uh, I'll hopefully speak to you again soon. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Okay. Bye, all.